looking at the future of educational technology, there's definitely a place for Khan Academy. When we look at the past evolution of technology, definitely some things on here that are familiar, a chalkboard, um, an overhead projector in the 1930s, which we can still see in a lot of classrooms, um, scantrons still being used. When we look at personal computers, again, an evolution that really took off in the 1980s and early 1990s. And in the classroom, we can definitely predict that there will be an increase of interactive technology, such as whiteboards and things like that, as well as personal devices for students, and more workstations that really focus on allowing students to collaborate with each other, whether that's online or with other uh, tools in the classroom. So we're just going to focus on three things. What does the future look like in education? How will technology evolve in education? And how Khan Academy has a place in all of that. So looking at the future in educational technology, it's clear we can predict that the classroom will see an increase in flipped classrooms and blended learning. Podcasts are taking off more, PLC or professional learning communities, group of learners, um, and just the use of technology in general. We're going to see an increase in Chromebooks, tablets, and other devices. And of course, continue to see more differentiation and project and inquiry based learning, as well as problem solving and critical thinking. That's a huge component, and some more blogging and education. So technology, and specifically, we can see that the flipped classroom is the hot topic. Again, a lot of classrooms are looking for resources to utilize the flipped classroom, and Khan Academy definitely plays a role in that. We're going to see more videos and more tutorials online for students to access. And Google definitely has a play in that as well. We've seen an increase in Chromebooks being purchased in this past year. And a lot of districts are leaning more toward Google Classrooms with uh, different apps and things like that. Other possible changes will be in digital textbooks. We can see that there will be more gaps being filled using computer programs such as Khan Academy. Um, and having more access to content will provide students with uh, different lessons that they can access. Uh, personal devices for each student, more classroom websites and digital student portfolios, more assessments being taken place online and benchmark testing, uh, state tests, and of course an incorporation of social media has also been evolving this past uh, couple of years and podcasts. So Khan Academy has definitely been growing and really we see a continuation of that where they're going to be adding more videos, more exercises, and all of that is aligning more and more with Common Core as we have 44 states right now in the US who have adopted the Common Core standards. Also students being able to gain more access to more topics and lessons and eventually using mobile devices, using smartphones, more translations available for those English, um, English language learners, and again using Khan Academy in the flipped classroom. So needless to say, expansion for Khan Academy. So our founder of Khan Academy, Sal Khan, he mentions that they've already taken steps in computer programming and they hope to, um, in the future, do some more things with writing and music composition as well. And they have a, a deep computer programming platform where it's about creating student portfolios that has a peer assessment component. So that'll be interesting to see. And they don't really see a future in SAT-like portfolio-based assessment. And their focus isn't really on assessment, but more on learning and creating, which I think is very appropriate. So most likely, we'll again see that it'll continue to be free to the public. That's a huge 
Um, selling point for Khan Academy, I don't see them changing that. And again, expanding the subject areas like it just mentioned in the other slide in writing um, and other, other subjects. Improving the reports and just really tweaking the relevance of their reports and the information and the feedback being provided. Um, and just a, a natural increase in the number of people who are visiting their website will see that increase as well. But with all of that to say, I don't see Khan Academy really replacing teachers or becoming a school, if you want to call it that. I, I just I really see Khan Academy being a platform for online learning via videos, exercises, practicing problems, and earning some rewards or whatnot. And then also being used in class for face-to-face -face instruction as well as interaction with each other, discussing what they're learning online, um, and collaborating with their peers, what they're benefiting from um, in Khan Academy. And then really a huge strong point for Khan Academy is the, the value that they receive at home. So they can go home, reflect, they can review problems, practice other lessons, research, a lot of opportunity for growth. So I don't see the physical classroom going away. Um, and I liked this quote from Drew Rosenweig uh, from Washington, D.C., where they said, socialization is key to development. Technology can also act as a barrier that may actually impede growth the nuances of human interaction are lost when a computer is between people. We'll end up with a generation of kids who don't know how to exist among other people. So there's great benefit in technology and computers, but using Khan Academy as a platform for discussion allows that face-to-face -face interaction and, and a, a platform for discussion. So ending up, I really I liked these quotes just on the value of technology in education and um, getting information off the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. Very true. There's a lot out there so teachers really need to hone in on what is appropriate and beneficial for their students. Uh, Sydney Harris, the real danger is not that computers will begin to think like men but that men will begin to think like computers. So providing opportunities for independent thought really important as well. And then the more well-known author of this quote, it is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge from Albert Einstein. So Khan Academy is going to be leaning more, I think, to the creative side, but for right now it's pretty straightforward lessons. So Will Richardson, another good quote, students are encouraged to connect with others and to collaborate and create with them on a global scale. It's not do your own work so much as do work with others and make it work that matters. So hopefully Khan Academy will really hold on to that and grab onto that. So just to end, I'm going to end the commentary here, but I have a two minute video. It was an interview that 60 Minutes did with Sal Khan three years ago and he he discusses what he sees the future of education looks like and even though it's three years ago it's still slowly evolving to some of the ideas that he had but some of the things that he mentioned um, are definitely something to think about as educators and um, kind of just shows that he has a future mindset which I really admire so hopefully you enjoy it. There's still a curriculum in schools. There's still grades. You go from one grade to the next. How does Khan Academy fit within existing curriculum? But I mean, should grades, I mean, should those become more blurry in terms of the lines? You know, that's one of the, the at least in my opinion, one of the exciting things about this is because as soon as you say all students work at their own pace and master concepts before they move to other concepts, which is how you would learn anything else. I mean, you wouldn't learn to ride a unicycle until you mastered a bicycle. But as soon as you make those assumptions, you can completely question some of the basic foundations of education. Do you have to separate kids into age-based cohorts? Can you have multiple age groups working together? There's actually a, a school in Los Angeles, Marlboro School, where they have 7th through 12th grade girls all working in the same classroom. Some of them are officially in calculus, some of them are officially in pre-algebra, but they're all working in the same class. You didn't have to separate them. And now you can get the older students mentoring the younger students 
and, and modeling things for them. Uh, you have, and then the teacher spends all of their time mentoring people. Now that every student's working at their own pace and you're not doing this one size fits all lecture, why do you have one teacher and 30 students, one teacher and 30 students, one thir teacher and 30 students? Why not have three teachers and 90 students and have everyone working with each other all the time? Uh, you know, so, so it makes you actually, yeah, I mean, why, why, why you don't need classrooms in the current form? You could have large workspaces. Is, is that the classroom of the future? Yeah, I think so. And I, you can also revisit what the calendar looks like. Why School should be a place where you can do some of your learning wherever you want virtually. But the physical environment is an environment that kids want to go to so that they get a support network to explore things deeper. And so I want the school of the future where, you know, where I hope to send my son in a few years, where he goes there and he can go there on the weekends if he wants. He can go there in the middle of July if he wants. But if we have a, you know, let's say I have a talk to give in London, and I'm like, that would be a really good experience for Imran to go to London with me. I'll just take him. There's no such thing as missing school now because you're not missing that lecture. You can watch it on the plane. Or maybe there's another school in London that's aligned and he can just start showing up at that school and start working with those kids.